primarily the Ohio Historical Society uh, arranged this museum and focused mainly on Anthony Wayne. And we're in the process of renovating it this winter or making some changes, especially with the exhibits. But um, um, what we're thinking about is that we'll probably include more of uh, Arthur St. Clair and that history because that's very interesting. But if you just walk through the museum, you'll see that the exhibits are all Anthony Wayne exhibits and over half of the display cases are about Anthony Wayne. Um, so actually the museum starts here with the historic Indian. So uh, this is the way the Indians would have looked at the time of the battle here in Fort Recovery. Um, the main Indians who were in this area were the Shawnee Indians and the Miami Indians. We can draw a real comparison between the prehistoric artifacts that we have upstairs with, the, with this historic Indian. Uh, his tools and weapons are made from metal. He has the English brown vest musket and also he has a metal axe uh, hanging at his waist there. He also has clothes that are made from cloth, uh, as opposed to the skins that the prehistoric Indians would have made their clothes from. Uh, and he would have gotten these things in trade first with the Frenchmen in the earlier times and then later with the British. They found that the British gave them a better deal, but I think the British probably had ulterior motives in their trading because they wanted to be allies of the Indians in keeping the Americans out of this Northwest Territory. He also has uh, a powder horn. This is how they carried the powder for their guns. Um, at this same time, the American soldiers would have been carrying their powder and paper cartridges. He also has a tobacco pouch hanging around his neck. The Indians used tobacco and other drugs, and uh, he carried uh, that in his uh, tobacco pouch. I'm sure you've heard of peace pipes and the other pipes that the Indians had, so they like to smoke uh, the tobacco and pipes. He has a gorget hanging around his neck. The gorgets that we have in the prehistoric collection are mostly stone gorgets, and we have some sandalwood gorgets that are made from conch shells. But this uh, Native American's gorget is made from pure silver. It looks black because it is uh, tarnished, but pure silver is very weak, so it uh, would disintegrate if we tried to clean it, plus the fact it's very, very old. He also has the adornment that you see in his nose and in his ears. He has nose rings, and he also pierced his ears and not only pierced them, but cut the cartilage behind them, and as you see, um, has weights hanging on the bottom of his ears that pull that cartilage down, so it's stretched way out. And around that, he has wound copper wire, so uh, he thinks he uh, looks pretty cool with the decorations that he has. They had their heads shaved and just had a top knot of hair in the back, and they would have one or two feathers uh, tucked into that uh, top knot of hair. So if you see Indians that have a lot of feathers hanging down at their sides, those are not woodland Indians, those are probably plains Indians. So this is very typical of the way the Shawnees and probably the Miamis as well look. The Shawnees used this area around here as their sacred hunting ground. They didn't actually have villages here not permanent villages, but they did use it as their hunting ground. The Miamis were a little more to the north uh, up here. Their headquarters was at uh, Kikianga, which is now present-day Fort Wayne, Indiana. The chief of the Shawnees was Blue Jacket, and we have a portrait of Blue Jacket hanging above the entranceway there. Uh, the painting was commissioned with a local portrait artist. Um, Blue Jacket, uh, in contrast to what Alan Eckert says in The Frontiersman, is and was uh, an Indian and not a white man who was captured and uh, became part of the Shawnee Nation. He was truly an Indian and was uh, one of their most uh, distinguished chiefs. The portrait that you see across from him is that of Little Turtle, who was the chief of the Miamis. He was really the esteemed Indian leader of the day. And the Miami Indians were really the esteemed Indian nation of the, the woodland nations uh, around our uh, areas here. So it was uh, to him that uh, the Europeans would go or the settlers would go if they wanted to make agreements or uh, have discussions and so forth. By the same token, the Indians also followed him as the ultimate leader and uh, his advice pretty much uh, prevailed. So uh, he was really a very respected leader at that time. 
And contrary to what people think about uh, Indians at that time, being savages and so forth, Little Turtle lived in a log cabin with windows and served tea to his guests at noon. So uh, it's not exactly the image we always have of the Indians of that 1790s time period. However, in both of the battles, both Little Turtle and Blue Jacket led the assaults. And, uh, and there were lots of things that happened that were very savage and very cool. But at the same time, you have to uh, imagine that uh, the Indian armies numbered between 2,000 and 2,500 warriors. And uh, I'm sure it wasn't easy to uh, keep those all under control uh, as uh, Little Turtle might have wanted to do at that time. So that uh, gives a little background as far as the Indians who were significant in this area. And then we'll move on to the cases that we have here um, at Fort Recovery that uh, display the, the early history. The fact that there is a beaver skin in this display case uh, emphasizes the fact that the fur trade was so important. And it's the way in which the Indians got the metal that they needed for the um, tools and the weapons that they used at that time. You see here the little metal arrowheads um, that were used and also the jewelry and uh, the tools that uh, were made uh, from materials that they received in trade. Uh, like I said before, first with the uh, French and then later with the British. Um, a lot of times people talk about arrowheads and they're referring to something that's about this big because anything they find in the fields and so forth they call arrowheads, but actually an arrowhead is uh, quite small. And so a lot of what they're referring to as arrowheads are actually spear points. And archaeologists refer to the whole collection as, as points. So uh, just take note of how small those arrowheads are on those particular arrows. But this, again, is um, the, these are the tools and the weapons of the historic Indians that were here. The Indians and the Europeans or the settlers had a reasonable relationship as long as it was a trading relationship, but there was something that really changed this whole picture. And what changed was um, the Revolutionary War. During the Revolutionary War, Washington was given ultimate authority, and uh, at one point when he was trouble, what, when he was having trouble getting recruits for his army, he offered them territory in he offered them land in the Northwest Territory if they would sign for another term with the uh, Army. And so many of the soldiers did that. That was the reason they continued fighting, is because they knew that they would receive land in the Northwest Territory after the war was over. That's assuming that the Americans were victorious. Um, and after the Revolutionary War, which of course the Americans were victorious, uh, in the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the English were to have given up all rights, not only to the United States, but all rights to the Northwest Territory as well. However, they continued to maintain large forts in the Northwest Territory, and there really wasn't anything that uh, the United States could do about it, because they certainly didn't have the army to be able to go into the Northwest Territory to drive the English out. Also, the Indians did not think that they were covered in any way by the agreement of the Treaty of Paris. The Americans thought they were because they were the allies of the British. So whatever pertained to the British, they felt pertained to the Indians as well. And the Indians said, we were not represented there, so we had nothing to do with that agreement. And we in no way gave up rights to this Northwest Territory. And you can see where it's just a perfect, perfect setting at that point for conflict because you have two people who believe in two very different situations at that point. And so the situation there is one that is going to be very explosive. Um, in the next showcase, the, the surveying instrument is included because the Northwest Territory was the first territory to be totally surveyed before it was ever settled. So that was quite a remarkable achievement and one worthy of, of note. Um, archaeologists, excuse me, uh, uh, surveyors who come through the museum today, and we do get a number of surveyors that are particularly interested in the uh, Greenville Treaty Line, uh, say that the early surveying was really very, very accurate, and a lot of what they do now, they use, well, all of what they do now, they use computers and that kind of technology, but they find that the early sur surveyors, with the tools that they had at that time, long chains and, 
instruments like this, um, they did a very accurate job of surveying even at that time. The Northwest Territory, of course, is Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. So this was very rich land and very desirable land, and uh, lots of countries would like to have laid claim to this Northwest Territory. As I mentioned, the situation was becoming quite explosive after the Revolutionary War was over because now the soldiers were coming in to claim their land and there was actually land in the Northwest Territory set aside for them. It was actually labeled Army land. And the government of the United States was very happy to have these soldiers settling in this Northwest Territory because what better way to control the land than to have people living there. It's very hard to control territories uh, where you don't have your own people living. So they promoted the movement of these settlers into this uh, territory, into the Ohio country. However, of course, the Indians are already living here on this land. And uh, with the uh, Americans now moving into the land, the uh, Indians are uh, defensive, and of course all of us would be if uh, someone came in and wanted to take over our homes and said this land now belongs to me. Plus the fact that there's a very much of a cultural difference between the way the Indians looked at the land and the way the Americans looked at the land. Uh, Native Americans did not believe you could own land. They thought of the land just like they did the sky and the oceans and the rivers and so forth that it was here for everyone to use. So when an American would come in to settle the land and he would put a fence up and say, this land now belongs to me, uh, the Indians could not understand how that could possibly be. So there's a real clash of cultures that's happening now at this point. And when you have that kind of a situation, it very often ends up in a military conflict. And that's what the situation turned out to be here because as the Indians came in and did all they possibly could to scare away the settlers, uh, killing the parents and stealing not only the horses and the cows and the chickens, but also the children, uh, the settlers lived in a great deal of fear. They said that they never relaxed, and when, even when they went to bed at night, that they went to bed with their guns at their sides. And any time they would hear an owl hoot, a bird chirp, or a dog bark, they jumped up immediately thinking that perhaps these were Indian signals to other Indians and that they were going to be under attack. So you can imagine the stress and pressure of living that kind of a life. So they clamored to President Washington to offer them some sort of uh, defense. And uh, so his response was to send General Josiah Harmer uh, out to this uh, Ohio country to teach the Indians a lesson. His job was to engage the Indians at Kikianga, uh, at the headquarters, uh, which was the headquarters of the Miami Indians and in where, my, where uh, Little Turtle lived. Uh, their goal was to uh, uh, destroy that village and if possible, uh, I would assume also to uh, take care of uh, Little Turtle because he was the leader of that time. And, uh, and was planning a lot of these attacks on, uh, on the Americans. But General Harmer's troops made their way up to that land and didn't encounter, encounter any Indians along the way. The Indians stayed ahead of them at every point as they were moving up through this territory. Um, however, as they approached Kikianga uh, at the headquarters of the, or the headwaters of the, the Maumee River uh, and where the three rivers come together, um, he heard that there were a large number of Indians amassing against him. Um, he divided his troops, but in the process, or at about that same time, the Indians attacked his troops from behind and completely destroyed General Harmer's troops. So before he ever got off any offensive action, his uh, troops were already destroyed. Now this was not really an army. These were mostly militiamen from the original states. Um, our country at that time, the states really wanted states' rights. They wanted the states to be strong, but they didn't want a strong central government. You probably studied that in your history class. Um, and 
uh, they were willing to send their own state militia, but were not willing to have a strong army of the United States. So these were primarily militiamen that uh, General Josiah Harmer uh, came up here to, uh, to fight the Indians with. Um, this disaster of uh, Harmer's uh, supposed attack uh, actually had uh, major negative consequences because the uh, Indians now grew more bold than ever. Uh, they had handled the American army and uh, in, in effect they taught the American army a lesson instead of vice versa. Um, these, uh, this attack was uh, followed shortly thereafter with the Big Bottom Massacre where a number of civilians were killed. So the Indian attacks grew worse instead of better after Harmer's campaign. So at this point, the, the state of the Northwest Territory is, uh, the, the future of the Northwest Territory is very much at stake at this point. Um, and, they, and President Washington is able to convince Congress at that time that it is important to raise an American army, that they're going to have to have an organized army uh, with a general who knows what he's doing if they're going to control this Northwest Territory at all. Um, and so the person that he puts into charge is Arthur St. Clair. Arthur St. Clair was president of the Northwest Territory at that time. So he lived in this area. He was familiar with the Indians. He was familiar with the land. And so he was a very appropriate choice um, to head this army. In addition to that, he had been a fairly distinguished officer during the Revolutionary War. So if you put those two uh, attributes together, he should have been the perfect leader in this situation. Um, Arthur St. Clair's army is one that you would not want to have if you were heading up here to the Northwest Territory. His army was composed of army regulars. That's probably okay, although the regulars had not seen much action in the Revolutionary War. They were fairly inexperienced regulars. Then he had the Kentucky militia men who were part of the army. And uh, the militia men were rough, tough Kentucky frontiersmen who knew how to handle guns and had encountered the Indians on many occasions um, in a negative manner. Uh, but they were very insubordinate. They just didn't take directions very well from uh, superior officers. And then the last third of his army uh, was composed of 180-day specials who were prisoners who were given the option of staying in prison or going to fight the Indians for 180 days. So not only was their character in question, uh, but the fact that after 180 days they were just gone, that really compromised uh, St. Clair's ability to have an effective army. And if that wasn't enough, um, he also had a major problem with supplies. Congress had allocated uh, funds to fund this army, which was a big move on their part since they didn't really want to do that. Um, so there were funds that were allocated for um, furnishing supplies for the army from everything from clothes to tents to weapons to, and tools. Um, and uh, once they started out coming through the Northwest Territory, they found that the supplies were very, very inferior. The horses were on their last leg. The, Tents disintegrated in the rain, the shoes were falling apart, a lot of times the ammunition was the wrong size for the guns, the food was buggy and wormy. Whatever could have been wrong with the supplies was wrong with the, with the supplies. The quartermaster who equipped the army was a civilian um, at this particular time. Uh, but Arthur St. Clair, and he was under a great deal of pressure to move and to keep moving, so so that he would reach again the headquarters of the Miami Indians. So his goal again was to get up to around the Kikiangia Anga area um, by, before winter set in. Um, and so he was under constant pressure to keep moving. His idea was if we would build a series of forts through the Northwest Territory, it would assert the uh, presence of the American Army and of the Americans in general in this um, Northwest Territory or Ohio country as it was also referred to. He thought if they would build a fort every 20 to 25 miles, it would create a supply system and a safety system through this um, territory. 
because that's how far a pack horse can go in one day. So he started out from Fort Washington and 20 miles to the north he built Fort Hamilton. Now it would take them four, um, they could chop down about four to five miles a day using the tools and equipment that they had and the soldiers that they had. And they were building this road now at this point uh, up from Fort Washington. From Fort Hamilton, they went about 25 miles to the north and they cleared a, a place where they camp, but did not at that time build a fort, but later uh, Fort St. Clair was built there. And then 20 miles to the north, they built Fort Jefferson. So you can see that they're building this road up through the Northwest Territory, and we know that today is State Route 127. So if you follow State Route 127, you're going to go through those places. Fort St. Clair is where Eaton, Ohio today uh, stands. From Fort Jefferson, he moved only seven miles to the north and camped there waiting for fresh supplies and the payroll to come in. He actually, uh, St. Clair rode a horse back to Fort Washington and, uh, and was told that his supplies would catch up with him, that he should keep moving. So he went, uh, went back down the road to where the men were camping and from there went 20 miles to the north to the banks of what we know as the Wabash River. He thought he was on the banks of the St. Mary's River, which would have been close to where his goal was uh, of Kikiyanga, but instead it was the banks of the Wabash River right up side our uh, fort here. When he arrived that night, his men were sick and tired and demoralized, and they didn't take time to put up any fortifications that night. So they pitched their tents and, and their camp on the banks of the Wabash River out here where there was a slight clearing. His Kentucky militiamen went across the river, supposedly to be the first line of defense, but uh, Stories tell us that, uh, that the Kentucky militiamen never wanted to camp with the regular army. He considered them a bunch of eastern sissies, and so they insisted on camping on their own. So they went across the Wabash River uh, and camped there. Now, one of the things that George Washington, well, two of the things that uh, President Washington told Arthur St. Clair before he ever started out was two things. One, beware of a surprise attack. Two, always fortify your camp at night. And that night they did not fortify their camp. And heaven knows, knowing what happened the next morning, they certainly should have done that. However, uh, the Indians were watching them, Native Americans were watching them all along the way. They were watching their progress and just waiting for the perfect opportunity. And what they saw here was the perfect opportunity. The army was camped uh, where a little river flowed into the Wabash River created that triangle of land. So here was the army plus 250 women and children who followed the army along. And um, early the next morning on November the 4th, 1791, the Indians attacked under Little Turtle and Blue Jacket. They think there may have been as many as 2,000 warriors who attacked Arthur St. Clair's army of 1,200 soldiers. Within an hour's time, the warriors had the army completely surrounded. And within three hours time, 900 of those 1,200 soldiers were dead or mortally wounded. They just kept drawing in the circle tighter and tighter and using crossfire because the army was just caught uh, on that triangle in that circle. They would probably all have died had it not been that Arthur St. Clair ordered Colonel Dark to lead a bayonet charge, engage the Native Americans in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and to drive a wedge through that circle of Native Americans. So the point at which Arthur St. Clair met the Indians was in that little creek um, that we now call Buck's Ditch. But after that battle for years and years, that was referred to as Bloody Run because of the blood that was shed right there at that point. However, he was successful in opening up enough of a space that the uh, soldiers who were able to get out did get away. And that included Arthur St. Clair. Arthur St. Clair had gout so bad 
that he was unable to walk. During the course of the battle, he had three horses shot out from under him. And when they were leaving the, the site of the battle, getting away, retreating, um, some of his men put him on the back of a pack horse and he was able to get back to Fort Jefferson. Now there was some question about that later because he left a lot of injured soldiers back on this field with no protection. Uh, they ran as fast as they could or if they were able to get a pack horse to get back to Fort Jefferson to the protection of the fort that was there. Um, their goal, if you were one of these soldiers who was running, your goal was not to be the first one back to Fort Jefferson. Your goal was to get ahead of the people ahead of you. Because it's just like when animals are hunted, the weak ones are the ones who get caught, the ones on the fringes. And so your goal was to stay ahead of the pack, if at all possible, because the Indians were attacking from behind. The uh, Indians, the Native Americans, pursued them up to four to five miles, and then remembered the booty that was on the ground back here, and turned around and back. One of the soldiers who tried to escape uh, stumbled and fell and rolled up against a log that was just outside uh, this uh, battleground and, and he lay there motionless for a day and he watched what happened back here on the battlefield and uh, first of all he reported that it looked like a pumpkin field, a steaming pumpkin field because of all the scout tents that were lying there. Um, he reported that after the Indians left, the warriors left to pursue the uh, army, uh, that the Native American women came out of the forest and proceeded to scalp the soldiers. Um, so they were involved in that as well. Um, when they came back later to bury the dead, uh, they found that there were stakes the size of a woman's wrist driven through their hearts into the ground. Their message was, um, or their culture, part of their culture was that if your heart is staked to the ground, your spirit cannot rise and go to heaven. Um, they also found that all the soldiers had their mouths shoved full of ground. And the message in that was, if you're so land hungry, that's what you're going to get. The whole goal was to create such a scene that no one would again attempt to move into this Northwest Territory. And certainly this soldier who observed what was happening here, and I won't go into the atrocities, you can read about them if you want to, I have a book out there that describes it really well. Uh, but uh, it, it was just unbelievable because, you know, a lot of these soldiers and the 250 women and children, they all died except for one red-haired woman named Nance who managed to get on the back of a pack horse uh, with a soldier. He pulled her up on the pack horse with him. And she had a baby in her arms right before she did that and she laid it on the ground because um, she didn't think the Indians would kill the child because the Indians very often kidnap children but they didn't often kill the children. But I think in this case it was probably an exception that probably no one made it off of this land alive. Um, she spent the rest of her life looking for that child, which was a daughter, and, and never did find her. Um, but uh, uh, the, the atrocities that took place were, uh, were really uh, quite unbelievable because, as I mentioned before, the soldiers, many of them were not dead, and um, so they saw what was happening and they were tortured and, and so forth. But there again, uh, it's not to say that the Indians did this and that they are alone responsible for it. Because from what I've read, well, it's not just because of what I've read, but history documents that, uh, that, the, that the Americans often do um, savage kinds of things as well. And in this case, they were fighting for their homeland and they considered these invaders to be their their greatest enemies ever. So uh, you have to put that all in perspective when you think about uh, what happened here. So I, you know, I, I know I mentioned the atrocities because it's interesting, but by the same token, it all has to be put into uh, into perspective. Um, it's hard to underestimate what happened here. This was such a significant battle. There were repercussions from this battle that were felt around the world. First of all. 
who was in control of this Northwest Territory. This was very rich land. It was a huge section of the United States. It was contingent to the United States. Uh, England, of course, had a great interest in this, and at this point, they were in charge. They were the allies of the Indians, and they were in control of the Northwest Territory. Uh, at the same time, uh, France and Spain wanted this land, and, um, and they too were watching to see what would happen. Very well be living in the country of Canada today, because Canada stayed a, an English, uh, true to the king, uh, and an English country. Uh, this was the greatest loss ever suffered by the United States Army and the greatest victory ever in the United States for the Native Americans. And, uh, and it's sometimes a little difficult to follow this thought, but it was the greatest victory of a Native force over a white invading force in the history.